right, good evening again, and welcome this evening. We're thrilled to be able to meet uh, virtually uh, this evening, but what a joy uh, it was uh, this morning to be able to meet together, uh, to fellowship one with another, albeit looking a little bit differently with social distancing and whatnot, but an absolute joy uh, this morning to hear you all sing uh, and to be together uh, for the most part in person. I know some have still chosen to to watch virtually, and that's okay. Uh, we want you all to stay safe. We want you all to stay wise. Uh, but it is really truly amazing uh, to me how sometimes, uh, looking back to what it used to be uh, here, being able to meet without you know social distancing and masks and that type of uh, stuff, and it was it's in, it's amazing to me sometimes how we can tend uh, and lean towards apathy uh, in what we experience. Uh, graciously, uh, week in and week out, and then when those gifts are removed, uh, where we can't meet together perhaps in person, uh, we realize then that perhaps we take a lot of things for granted, uh, such as meeting together uh, in person. Um, I think this scenario really is no no different, and I and I trust through this process and continually as we as we try to be wise and meeting together uh, I trust that we'll continue to grow I trust that you have grown over the past few months but I trust that we'll continue to grow uh, as well because the purpose of uh, our lives and, and growth is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ uh, and I also hope that we understand that we should never really want to go back to the way that things were. Uh, God placed this uh, infection and disease, COVID-19, he placed this into our, our lives for a purpose, and that purpose it was to grow us, to stretch us, perhaps even to bring us out of our comfort zone, to help us realize uh, those necessary things within our ministry, and perhaps even for us to realize uh, the, the things in our ministry that aren't as important. And so I trust we'll continue to allow God to change us and never revert back to the way things were uh, before. I don't, I don't want to be the same. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, experience the same thing week in and week out. I want to continue to elevate our worship, continue to elevate Christ. Uh, and to elevate our ministry uh, to, for Christ, uh, and to do so, really, again, focusing back to our upward gaze, uh, what we're studying through uh, in Hebrews, and magnifying Christ, uh, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let's jump right into uh, the sermon this evening. Uh, we have much ground uh, to cover as we continue to go through our brief study of cross-generational service and discipleship. Uh, and I did want to preface this evening uh, really by saying that if you haven't watched the evening service from last week, I would encourage you uh, to do so. It's really laying the foundation uh, for what we're going to be studying this evening. And much of what will be said this evening could be taken out of contract context if we hadn't looked back at what we looked at uh, last Sunday evening. And so if you would just go to our YouTube channel if you haven't seen last week, uh, last Sunday evening, I would encourage you to go ahead and watch that first because, again, it really does lay the foundation for what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. Also, uh, last week I had said that this was going to be a two-week study, and the more that I studied this week, I, I went to Pastor and I said, I'm not going to be able to do this in uh, two weeks. There's just too much information, so he graciously has given me an extra week. So you all are stuck with me again this week and next week. So I apologize for that, um, but uh, we'll we'll... I'm looking forward to continuing this study and even going a little bit deeper, perhaps, than we originally thought we were going to be doing. Um, but uh, last Sunday, just as far as a brief review, last Sunday we discussed biblically the importance of each member and how each member is a part of a larger body. Uh, each member uh, of the body of Christ or church is an indispensable member, is a vital Member. Each member has gifts that have been graciously given to them by God to utilize within the church. Uh, if a member isn't utilizing those gifts, then the church isn't functioning at full capacity. Uh, each member is dispensable. Each member's gifts 
are vital. Each gift comes from God and God alone. There's nothing that we have in and of ourselves to be able to present, but by God's grace, he's graciously given us those gifts to utilize within his bride. We then closed out the service by stating what the purpose of the church really was and the the purpose of each member. And each member has been sovereignly placed into a body on purpose. That purpose is the glory of God. The glory of God is paramount, and that's why we do what we do. It's not for our glory, not for our promotion, uh, but for the glory of God alone. And Cornerstone Baptist Church is not our church. I hope we understand that. It is God's church, and he must receive the glory. We looked at that biblically last week from Romans chapter 12. And this week, uh, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 12 down through verse 27, then we'll pray together. Uh, Really, verses 1 through 11 are mentioning a lot of the gifts uh, within the church in the the New Testament church. Uh, Some of these gifts are are not uh, uh, applicable uh, anymore, such as tongues. We won't actually have time to get into that. But verses 1 through 11 really talk about specific gifts that are utilized within the church. Then uh, verse 12, Paul, in talking and really preaching and writing this letter to the church at Corinth, he then goes into verse 12 through the rent, really the end of the chapter. We'll only look through down through verse 27. Uh, but he states that every believer is a member of a larger body, that being the church. You're in 1 Corinthians 12. Let's re- start in verse, tw- uh, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 27, then we'll pray. Verse 12, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members that of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Again, a representation of the church being like Christ. For we uh, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bound or free, uh, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. All we have to do is look at Cornerstone Baptist Church and understand not everyone is the same. Uh, we are uh, all members, but we are Uh, Sorry, for the body is not one member, but many. Verse 15, the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Obviously, no. And if the ear shall say, because I am not of the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Again, no. If the whole body were an eye, uh, where were the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would the smelling? Uh, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in in the body as it hath pleased him. God has, God was pleased to place us within Cornerstone Baptist Church and each of us different members of this body. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Verse 23, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, uh, having given more abundant honor to that part which lack. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Let's pray together and then we'll look at this idea of our church being a body and us being members this evening. Father, We ask that you would guide uh, our thoughts this evening. Uh, We would uh, that you would cause us to concentrate, uh, and that you would open our eyes and open our hearts, and that the word, uh, your your word, might fall on good soil and grow again for the purpose of growing us to become more like your Son Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, this church and that you ordained for us to be here. We thank you for each member. 
of this body uh, and the importance of each member. Lord, we ask that we would recognize our responsibility, also recognize the responsibility to encourage those other members uh, within our church family. Lord, again, change us. I ask that you would uh, be with uh, my mouth this evening, that nothing would be said that would contradict what your word would have us learn uh, this evening. Again, Lord, we, we ask that you would change us. Uh, we pray this in your son's name. Uh, amen. If you, well, first of all, I want to ask a, a couple questions. Uh, and really, before I ask a couple questions, I want to, I want to do two things in particular this evening. Uh, I want to study, uh, really, again, with the focus point of, uh, of the imperative and indispensable members and their gifts. Uh, now, tonight, again, I would like to, uh, at the beginning, at the onset, to expose perhaps a misguided mindset. And then number two, I want to correct that misguided mindset with a biblical mindset. And this will make sense uh, more so as, as we go along. Exposing uh, a potential misguided mindset and then correcting that misguided mindset with a biblical mindset. And I want to ask us, how many generations are within Cornerstone Baptist Church? Uh, just to do a little brief study, uh, you have the GI generation, uh, which would be the 1900 to 1924. You have the silent generation, uh, which would be 1925 to 1945. You have baby boomers, which are 46 to 64. You have Gen X, uh, which is 65 to 79. You have the millennial or Gen Y, uh, which is 1980 to about 2000 or so and on. Uh, you have the new silent generation, or Gen Z, which would be 2000 to uh, as where we are currently. And we here at Cornerstone really have uh, quite a wonderful spread and balance of several individuals within these uh, certain generations, except for the GI generation, which ended in 1924. Uh, we have several within each of these generations. And if you study out the generations, which is rather revealing, by the way, uh, and quite interesting, and I actually have a detailed list of each generation, and it's quite uh, su uh, substantial. Um, it's about 14 pages of generational differences. So it's quite an interesting study. Uh, you, you discover each generation, who influenced their generations. You study their core values, their attributes, their views of work, their views of family, their views of relationships, uh, their leadership styles, their views on authority, uh, how each generation tends to communicate, how they prefer to communicate. And again, this list is rather detailed, and I've taken quite a bit of time in the past to study out each generation and these qualities to make up this list. Now, uh, while we really don't have time to look into each specific generation uh, and the cultural explanations of each generation, it is quite, quite revealing and beneficial to do so. If that's something that you would want to read through, please let me know, and I'd be happy to send it uh, over to you. Uh, but what's fascinating about looking into each generation is that you find these certain qualities within the body of Christ uh, as well. I just want to highlight a few qualities per generation just to kind of get the creative juices flowing and to uh, kind of understand uh, how these are going to bleed over into uh, the local church. And obviously some of these are going to overlap. Again, these, these, don't, uh, these specific qualities aren't characteristics of every single person within each generation, but for the most part. You have your silent generation, the 1925 to 45. A few qualities. They are uh, patriots. Uh, they are heavy on patriotism, respect, um, and uh, that my authority must be respected. And because I am an older generation, therefore, I, I really need to be respected as well. Uh, the silent generation, a quality about their work ethic was they worked to survive, again, during this uh, Great Depression time. You have your baby boomers, which are 46 to 64, 1946 to 64. Uh, they're all about equal opportunities. They're all about being loyal to their children. Uh, they 
while the silent generation worked to survive, this generation lived to work, again, going off of what they were taught when they were children. They lived to work. Uh, they're all about involvement. They're extremely competitive. You have your Gen uh, X, which is 65 to 79. They're all about diversity. Again, you think of what happened within our country during those, uh, those years. They're all about diversity. They're entrepreneurial. They're independent. They seek life balance. Uh, they're semi-suspicious of the baby boomer values. Uh, they're beginning to be more tech-savvy. Uh, they're self-starters. They're self-driven. Uh, and while the silent generation works to survive, the baby boomers live to work. Gen X work to live. Again, it kind of swung the pendulum in the opposite direction of their parents uh, where they saw these these parents wanting to, uh, they, they lived to work. Well, this generation swung the pendulum in the opposite direction, and they tend to work to be able to live their lives. Then you get to the millennials, those who we love so much, right? Uh, you get to 1980 through 2000, they're into extreme, they're into extreme fun, uh, they're all about self-confidence. They're hotly competitive. Uh, they are uh, interested in facts. They have the tendency to tell you, show me the facts. Uh, they love attention. Uh, they're very tech savvy. Uh, they tend to be people pleasers. And again, about work, they love to spend over save. Again, these are just they're not exhaustive whatsoever, but these are some of the qualities within each generation. Again, they're not exhaustive, but I wanted to mention a few of these qualities within each, gener within each generation and within each generation within the church. And more than likely, while I was reading these qualities, you were probably thinking along the lines of, yep, that's for sure, or uh, yep, that's right, uh, they are, that generation is so frustrating or uh, even, as I mentioned, a quality, you might have said, yeah, well, that's putting it mildly. Not everyone in these generations, again, is like this, and the list was just a cultural norm, okay, for each generation. And the folks, the, the reason why I bring these generational differences up is because believers in the church have a misguided or tend to have a misguided mindset of different generations within the body of Christ. Now, let me explain. Sadly, our culture has dictated our view of generations and their qualities. Our culture breeds and feeds our incorrect mindsets, and I'm going to prove why they're incorrect mindsets. Case in point, our reactions when we were going through the list of generations and their qualities. Unfortunately, we view our generation that we are in as the best generation, obviously. My generation is the best generation. And we tend towards negativity towards other generations. And this evening, without splitting up our four generations, let's just speak on an older generation, and let's speak on a younger generation. Now, I'm not going to place you into any of those generations. I want you to do that in your mind. You know if you would fall under the category of an older generation or a younger generation. And you can place yourself into uh, whichever of those categories you would like to. But for the purpose this evening, really, is, is to expose those misguided mindsets. But then to correct those mindsets biblically and to re-recognize the indispensability of every single member of Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I want to pause here uh, and ask you to please consider who is speaking. Uh, please consider the messenger this evening. I know I'm a part of a younger generation. I'm within the millennial generation. But I do this study. I, I ask God to help me do it humbly, uh, with my goal being really to cause Cornerstone Baptist Church to open our eyes and to understand the, uh, perhaps a problem, uh, and to battle that problem biblically. And my goal shim simply is just to share God's word with you all, not to give my perspective from a younger generation, but to just share God's word I hope you believe that. Uh, I want us to be a cross-generational church. I want us to be a church that serves cross-generationally. I want us to be a church that disciples cross-generationally. 
I want to be a church that is actively serving. I want us to be a church that is actively discipling. So I just wanted to get that out of the way so that we all understand the messenger and that I want us to approach this biblically. First, I want to discuss our culture's negative views, and then I want to discuss on how those views bleed over into the church. First of all, let's begin with an older generation. And again, I want to reiterate that this is what our culture has dictated in our views of an older generation. What does, for you as an older generation, what does the younger generation accuse you of being? Again, speaking culturally, what does the younger generation culturally tend to accuse you of being? They could say there's not much energy there. They could say they're crabby. Uh, They have outdated ideas. Others can do it better or quicker. They're disconnected to the real world. Uh, These aren't the good old days anymore. Uh, They're needy. They're too opinionated. They're limited. Again, these are some views that perhaps a younger generation accuses an older generation of being. What about a younger generation? What does an older generation accuse you of being culturally? You could be accused of being uh, immature, irresponsible, lazy, Low to zero personal expectations, low to zero personal experience. Uh, They may be tech savvy, but they lack relationally. Uh, They're undependable, they're entitled, they're opinionated, they're limited. Sadly, these cultural mindsets, folks, have found their way into the church. And within the church, we might not be actively trying to squelch different generations, but perhaps subconsciously, because we're influenced by this outside culture and worldview of generations, perhaps we are subconsciously squelching other generations. I actually call this a passive depreciation within the local church. And in the church, a younger generation tends to view the older generation as not having energy crabby set in their ways. Younger folks can do it better and quicker. Older generation is too opinion. They're limited. They don't respect us. And on the other hand, within the church, the older generation, again, tends to view the younger as being immature, irresponsible, lazy, no experience, undependable, entitled, too opinionated, limited. The older generation doesn't respect the younger generation. What do you find about those two lists? There is a frightening correlation between the two. And how do those cultural views bleed into the church? Many, if not most, of these misconceptions and accusations are exactly the same, cross-generationally. I don't know if you noticed that. But isn't that interesting that no matter what generation we're in, we struggle with common accusations as other generations do? Again, all these accusations are based from a worldview and cultured opinion or experience. Folks, none of these accusations are based from a scriptural source. None of them. All of these accusations are based on what the culture tells us is the norm. And I ask us, has that fallen into even our church, into Cornerstone Baptist Church? Not one of those misconceptions is based off of God's word. You say, Pastor Caleb, what's the end result? Well, the end result is quite devastating. Both younger and older generations, because of our misguided and accusatory attitudes and viewpoints, we fail as a church. We fail to pray for a different generation. We fail to disciple a different generation. We fail to challenge humbly a different generation. Sometimes we even fail to include different generations. We do one of two things. We either excuse the behavior of a different generation as that's just the way they are, Or we become offended, and by doing so, we cut them off completely and say they are in no position to serve whatsoever. And these are issues that we find within the church today, folks. Maybe not within our church, maybe so. But within the church in general, these are issues that we find. And humbly, I want to ask myself, 
And I want to ask you, as part of the body of Cornerstone Baptist Church in Scarborough, Maine, could we fall into this trap as well? And as we now battle those cultural mindsets with biblical mindsets, we need to ask ourselves two questions. What do we gain when we have biblical mindsets? But what are we missing out on when we don't have biblical mindsets? I would encourage you, uh, as we walk through these, to keep your eyes on yourself, not in a prideful way, but keep your eyes on yourself and what you have to learn. So often when we preach these type or teach these types of things, our mind automatically reverts to somebody that, who comes, somebody else who comes to our mind. Keep your eyes on yourself and what we need to learn, what I need to learn through this. Don't let your minds revert back to, I need to work on this, but this person needs to work on it more. Don't let your mind do that. Clothe yourself with humility in this study. First of all, I want us to reject, and I think God's word is very clear on what we should do. We need to reject cultural expectations. And while culture carries extremely low expectations for other generations, I think scripture is very clear and carries very positive contrast between generations. And we're fighting, folks, we are fighting a battle of cultural norms versus biblical perspectives. It's a constant battle that we're fighting. We need to fight those cultural norms with true, powerful, transformative gospel change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 makes it pretty clear. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A believer is a new person. Change is the reality of one transformed by the gospel. Change is a part of someone who's being consistently transformed. Again, elevating our ministry, elevating our Christian lives upward, our gaze being upward, our, our focuses for 2020. Change is the reality of one who is being transformed by the gospel. Bondage to sin is gone. Slavery to cultural norms and sinful perspectives is defeated. Freedom in Christ is real. What about Romans 12, 1 and 2? We looked at this a little bit last week. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A believer serves a new purpose now. God does the work of transformation, and the word of God does the work of renewal in our minds. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Folks, the gospel is constantly changing us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ began the work and will continue the work and will complete the work in you and in me. Please notice, folks, in the passages that we just read, that there are no age specifications. God doesn't place an age on maturity, nor does he place an expiration date on gospel change. No matter how long we've been saved, No matter how old we are or how young we are, there's no expiration date on the change that the gospel does in your life and in mine. Please notice also that God places all believers into this category. Again, look at Philippians 1.6. Listen as I read it. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, a believer, will perform it again will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 28 through 30 says, And we know all things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then also he called. And whom he called, them he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Folks, all of the circumstances in our lives right now, just think through like the list in your mind of the circumstances that God has placed you in. 
no matter what age you are, no matter what generation you are in, all circumstances are ordained for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that is to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Why? So that God might receive the glory. Every single circumstance. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Folks, we are, we are not our own anymore. We don't belong to ourselves. We're bought with a price. No matter how long we've been saved, no matter how long we have served within the church, the reality is, is that we have been bought with a price. Older generation or younger, there is no time to take off. We've been bought with a price. We belong to God, therefore serve. Romans 13, 13 through 14 tells us, let us walk honestly or properly as people who have been transformed by the gospel. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And Paul is talking about specific, is talking about specific sins here, but it also could apply to the sin of self-centered passion, self-centered desire, or self-centered pursuit. Folks, my life is no longer about my pleasure. My pursuit, no matter what generation I'm in, is to be Christ-likeness. As an older generation, my pursuit isn't retirement, although retirement isn't wrong or sinful. My pursuit is Jesus Christ. As a younger generation, my pursuit is not the next best thing or the next best job or comfort. And while those things aren't necessarily wrong and sinful, my pursuit is to be more like Jesus Christ. Do I believe that God has given those gifts to us as believers? Absolutely. Do I believe God graciously allows us to enjoy the benefits of hard work? Yes. And I think scripture teaches that very clearly and teaches those principles. But do I believe that those things should be enjoyed at the expense of participation within the body of Christ? Absolutely not. Again, reviewing back to what we just discussed, we can truly be narrowed down to one thought. Rather than focusing on what culture has put forth as the norm for our generations, We must view those within the church and those possibly in different generations within the church through the lens of grace as useful, indispensable members who have been transformed by the gospel grace through the power of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to view others within our church. That's the lens that we need to view others through. And in closing, I want to challenge us I want to challenge our older generations and our younger generations specifically with just a few things. And as your assistant pastor, as your friend, I know Pastor Bateman would echo this as well, and someone who is definitely preaching to the choir as I stand behind this pulpit and share this with you, I want to push myself and I want to push us in just a few ways. I want to talk to the older generation, and you can place yourself into this generation if you wish, But an older generation, there's five things that we need from you here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Five things we need from an older generation. First of all, we need your presence at Cornerstone Baptist Church. As long as you are here on this earth, be present and interact. I promise you this will help you see where you can be more involved, where where the needs are. And you can even be more involved cross-generationally in discipleship. The more you're involved, the more you interact, the more those things will become more plain to you. We'll discuss discuss a little bit more in depth what cross-generational discipleship specifically means next week as we close out our study. But we need your presence. Older generation, we need your perspective. We need your practical, biblical wisdom. Many of you have been in God's word much longer than 
a younger generation within our church. Share that within your generation, but share that with other generations as well within Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I say this as a younger generation, but we may not be very good at soliciting wisdom from you all, but still give it, please. Still give it graciously, kindly, give it humbly, give it non-confrontationally. We need your wisdom. We need your perspective. We need your presence. We need your perspective, but we also desperately need your praise. The younger generation desperately needs your encouragement. We started last week by looking at Psalm 145, verse 4, which says, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. Folks, the younger generation, older, you folks listening as, a, as an older generation, the younger generation needs you to tell them what God has done in and for you. We need that. It's our responsibility to listen, but please don't stop doing it, even if it seems like we might not be listening. We need to hear your praise of your God. We also need your prayers. <clears throat> this really goes without saying. James 5.16 makes it very clear. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. We need you to pray for us. We need you to pray with us. We need you to pray for us. We need your effective and fervent prayers. We need your presence. We need your perspective. We need your praise. We need your prayers. But we also need your potency. And we need your active participation and utilization of your gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 tells us that each believer has graciously been given and has graciously received a gift from God for the purpose specifically of service within the local church. So use those gifts God has given to you by God's grace. Older generation, you have much to give. You might not seem like that you, you might not think that you do, but you really have much to give. You can disciple, you can volunteer, you can make visits, you can make phone calls, you can connect with others. When we're gathering together, you can make it a habit to sit next to someone different each Sunday or Wednesday. You can help with missions by prayer or support. You can bake pies, you can do cookies to show love to hurting families. You could do that for outreach as well. You can uh, stuff our outreach bags for our open door ministry. You can pray specifically for each child within our kids' programs and let them know that you are praying for them. You can be hospitable. You can show mercy and love. The list truly is endless, folks. Older generation, we need your potency. Now to the younger generation. What do we need from you here at Cornerstone Baptist Church? We have five things. And again, folks, we're going to see that a lot of these things overlap. But a younger generation, what do we need for you? And I'm talking, however young you want to place yourself into a generation, I'm talking to our youngest child watching. What do we need from you? Well, we need your presence as well here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. As long as you're here, be present and interact. And it's sad, as I look at my generation, it's sad to see my generation struggle mightily in this area. Being with God's people isn't necessarily high on our to-do list. Perhaps it isn't convenient in our eyes. Or there's something better that comes up, therefore we struggle to commit to the priority of God's places, uh, the priority that God places within his church. But a younger generation, we need you to be here. And we need you to be actively involved. If you're not present, again, Cornerstone Baptist Church isn't at full capacity if you're not here. The more involved you are, the greater influence you will have on other generations. We need your presence. Younger generation, we need your pizzazz. I'm going through all these P's and I couldn't find one, so I just picked pizzazz and it sounded good. But we need your pizzazz. We at Cornerstone Baptist Church desperately need your energy. If you look at Christ's example as a young man, Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There's three things. He increased in wisdom or maturity. He increased in stature. He increased physically. He increased with favor. Uh, he increased in favor with God and man. So he increased relationally as well. Young generation, you bring much life and vibrancy to our church body because simply because of your age. 
I'm only 33 and I'm learning more and more that my energy decreases as I get older, but I'm sure I have more energy than some in, within the older generation, and that's just the way God created the human body. Bring that vibrancy and energy to our church body. Others need to see it. The older generation can see it and feed off of it as well. We need your pizzazz. We need your energy. We also need your perspective. Younger generation, you need to glean truth from God's word on your own, and then you need to share it. Obviously, we must listen when someone older and wiser teaches us and admonishes us, but also we must humbly share God's word and what we're learning with them as well. Be the iron that sharpens the iron sharpening you. Scripture talks about iron sharpening iron. Be the iron that sharpens the iron that is sharpening you. Just as it's beneficial to see the world biblically through the eyes of an older generation, it's just as beneficial for an older generation to view the world biblically through the eyes of a younger generation. We need your biblical and truth-based views, not your personal opinions, not just what you think is right, but your biblical and truth-based views. We need your perspective. We need your presence. We need your pizzazz. We need your perspective. Younger generation, we need your participation. We desperately need you to utilize the gifts God has graciously given to you. Our youth group name is 412, and there's a purpose behind that. 1 Timothy 4.12 tells us, Let no man despise thy youth, but be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, or lifestyle, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And while we hold to the scripture as our base for our youth group ministry here at Cornerstone Baptist Church, understand Paul was writing to a young pastor named Timothy who was more than likely in his mid-30s or even into his 40s. At this time, Paul challenges Timothy as a younger generation, you must serve and be an example in service. You must show maturity. You must be actively participating in service and in edification, even if it's not expected from you by an older generation. That's no excuse. Be that leader. Be that example. Younger generation, lastly, just as the older generation. Younger generation, we need your prayers. Again, based off of James 5, we need your fervent and effectual or effective prayers. We at Cornerstone Baptist Church need you to commit to pray, not only for those you're close with, or not only for those within your generation, but for those in other generations. We need you to pray for them, and not just limiting your prayers to their health and their well-being. So often, and I can even look in my life and see my prayers for an older generation, and so often my prayers are limited to just their health and their well-being. Folks, it's so much deeper than that. Pray for them. As, as you pray for them, season those prayers with grace and pray that God might grow them. Pray that God might use them in our community and within our church body. Pray that God might challenge them spiritually. Pray that God would encourage them. Pray for your church. Pray specifically. Pray for those in different generations. Finally, before we close in prayer, I want to have a correct view of myself and I want to be effective for Christ within Cornerstone Baptist Church. Folks, we have to have a correct view of ourselves. And we have to have really a correct view of those ministering around us within Cornerstone Baptist Church. And to view ourselves and other members in different generations with different qualities, different strengths, different weaknesses, different ideas, different opinions even, we have to view ourselves and other members as new creatures transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, redeemed, justified, and progressing to become more like Christ. That's how we need to view others within our church and other generations. And not just to stop there, but to understand what gifts we have to be utilized within our church family. 
and then to use those gifts for God's glory. Not to come and sit and fold our arms and be stuffed the word of God and then leave, but to come with our sleeves rolled up, ready to serve, ready to edify, ready to minister one to another. Many believers within the church wish to determine their God-given gifts before beginning to participate within the church, and instead, biblically, I believe our approach should be to find out what needs there are and then commit time, energy, and prayer to meeting those needs. And then allowing God's grace and sovereignty to lead us to a consistent, effective participation. Our gifts will become more evident to us and to others more and more as we serve within the body of Christ. Next week, we'll close out this study, Lord willing, and if the Lord tarries, really focusing, focusing on how we would flesh this out specifically in cross-generational discipleship and what that actually looks like and what God's Word has to say. Really about the necessity and implementation of cross-generational discipleship within Cornerstone Baptist Church. Let's pray together, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it changes us. We ask that what was said tonight, that we would think on these things, consider these things, and ask you again to continue to change us to become more like your son. We love you, Father. We thank you. You first loved us and gave yourself for us. You gave yourself for your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave himself for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, oh, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, his name exalted more and more, whom all the saints in heaven adore, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, oh, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name.